years ago, in the skies over England, a deadly aerial contest was fought between the Royal Air Force and the German Luftwaffe. The RAF's victory in the Battle of Britain changed the course of the Second World War. This video ordnance program looks at the inheritors of this tradition, the air defense units of today's RAF. Located in the rolling countryside of northern Yorkshire, RAF Leeming is the home of an air defense wing of the RAF's Strike Command. At the time of the Battle of Britain in 1940, the RAF was divided into Fighter Command and Bomber Command. Since 1968, both elements have been unified into Strike Command. Strike Command has three main tactical groups. One group controls over 20 squadrons, including attack and transport aircraft. Its attack aircraft include the Harrier GR-5 jump jet and the Tornado GR-1. Eleven Group specializes in air defense of the United Kingdom and includes the wing at RAF Leeming. Eighteen Group is responsible for the maritime role, coordinating its actions with the Royal Navy's air element, the Fleet Air Arm. Separate from the Strike Command units based in Britain, RAF Germany is responsible for aircraft operating with NATO in Central Europe. Eleven Group is the modern ancestor of the legendary Eleven Group of the Battle of Britain. Its mission today is to defend Britain against hostile air attack. Its operating theatre is called the UK Air Defence Region, or UK ADR. The orientation of Britain's air defence has changed completely since 1940. Away from the south of England facing France, where Eleven Group fought in World War II, and towards the North Sea. For the past few decades, the main concern has been the Soviet bomber force operating out of bases in the northern USSR, which regularly fly simulated combat missions down the Norwegian coast towards British airspace. The main interceptor aircraft of 11 Group is the Tornado F-3, which entered service in the 1980s. It is supplemented by two squadrons of the older Phantom, which is scheduled to be replaced by the European fighter aircraft later in the decade. 11 Group can also depend on the Hawk, Britain's advanced jet trainer, which can be armed with Sidewinder missiles for close-range air defense. Unlike the German bombers of the Battle of Britain, modern bombers attack from long, standoff ranges, over a hundred miles away from the target, using large cruise missiles. The concept behind 11 Group's mission is to project a defensive screen of tornadoes far over the North Sea to intercept incoming bombers. Three Three Squadron, uh, the role in the uh, UK is to provide the air defence cover, uh, i.e. we generally in the Fleet Department patrol the, uh, the UK ADR, air defence region. Uh, we'd be uh, routinely scrambled to go and see uh, blips that the radar sites would pick up coming around from the uh, Kola Peninsula. Usually it's uh, routine patrols from the, uh, the Soviet bloc, uh, bears, badges, that sort of thing. Uh, we would go and uh, have a little look-see what they're bringing over, what they're up to. Uh, generally. Uh, wave at each other, generally be uh, jolly good fellows. Um, that's basically why we're here in peacetime. In wartime, the job is slightly different. Our job is to stop those same guys coming over. Uh, their, their aim would be uh, slightly different than in peacetime. They'd be coming to uh, drop uh, conventional or non-conventional weapons on the UK, and our job would be uh, to stop them over the sea um, and basically shoot them down before they get here and do any damage. 23 Squadron at RAF Leeming is typical of 11 Group units and shares a traditional link with the pilots of the Battle of Britain. At the outset of uh, the Battle of Britain, we were flying uh, Boston's and Bow Fighters in the night intruder role, and the squadron fairly quickly converted to Mosquitoes and then took over a night fighter and night intruder role. Uh, with that aircraft, the squadron deployed on night reconnaissance uh, sweep over northwestern France and uh, claimed several kills to its credit. As in the days of the Battle of Britain, at 23 Squadron there will always be a number of crews on ready alert, 
waiting for the scramble alarm to intercept an intruding aircraft. During peacetime, it's called a quick reaction alert, or QRA. A typical peacetime mission might well be a QRA launch. QRA is held by the Air Force 365 days a year, 24 hours a day. It's shared between the air defense stations in the UK, and at any given time, there are always uh, four airplanes on, one on readiness, which is basically a 10-minute readiness phase, which means theoretically that uh, within, the, within 10 minutes of the hoot to go, and the airplane's got to be airborne and on its way to intercept whatever the radar site have found uh, on their radar scopes. So, for example, out of here, we'd get launched with uh, a 10-minute scramble. 10 minutes after the hooter goes, we'd be in the airplane and get an airborne out of here, and then we're probably going to go uh, a long way north, well up to the uh, north of Scotland and out into uh, the Iceland Faroes Gap. The initial intercept would lead to um, the aircraft generally being visually identified as whatever. It might be a civilian airliner that's lost or perhaps, heaven forbid, uh, the real thing, uh, an enemy aircraft uh, with, uh, with intent uh, to prosecute an attack. Having conferred uh, with the superior authority, uh, if it were, say, an airliner that needed assistance, then our job would definitely then involve shepherding the aircraft to an airport or redirecting it on its route. Uh, clearly, and the other eventuality, we might find ourselves having made an intercept, identifying the aircraft, and perhaps if we were at state of war at that point. With advances in aviation technology over the past half century, Britain's interceptor aircraft have experienced dramatic changes. The post-war years saw the steady improvement of fighter radar and jet technology. Aircraft such as the Javelin mark the next stage in interceptor design, capable of operations day and night at supersonic speed. The 1960s saw the gradual replacement of the aircraft gun by the aircraft missile, as epitomized by the Lightning Interceptor with its Fire Street missiles. The latest step in British interceptor design is the Tornado F3. The Tornado is a multinational aircraft program with participation by Britain, Germany, and Italy. The basic version of the Tornado is a sophisticated ground attack aircraft. Its modification into an interceptor involved the replacement of its ground attack radar with the new Fox Hunter radar, designed specifically for the air intercept mission. The Tornado is a very different aircraft from its historical antecedent, the Spitfire. The Spitfire Mark II was a much smaller aircraft, weighing only 5,700 pounds, compared to the 47,500 pounds of the Tornado. The Spitfire was powered by a Rolls-Royce Merlin engine, giving it a top speed of 355 miles per hour. The Tornado's two Rolls-Royce turbojets give it an effective top speed of about 950 miles per hour. The Spitfire had a combat endurance of less than an hour, while the Tornado can operate for over two hours on internal fuel and over 10 hours with the aid of aerial refueling. The Spitfire had a combat radius of about 150 miles, while the Tornado has a combat radius well in excess of 750 miles. The Spitfire was armed with eight 30 caliber guns with a range of a few hundred feet. The Tornado carries eight missiles and it can attack an aircraft 30 miles away. The Spitfire was effective only in clear skies in daytime, while the Tornado can operate effectively day or night in nearly all weather conditions. Of course, when you look at the numbers of aeroplanes that we have in service now, I think that's uh, perhaps um, got to be taken into consideration that the firepower of modern aeroplane is considerably greater 
than uh, anything that North Korea had in the Second World War. We are firing medium-range missiles out to tens of miles. We are firing short-range missiles down to what would have been a good opening gun's range for a Spitfire pilot. And then, of course, we have the gun where we can go in effectively to uh, almost point-blank range if, ne if needs be to destroy him. The greater complexity of the Tornado compared to the Spitfire means that it needs an additional crewman, both a pilot and a navigator. We have two crew members. We have a pilot obviously in the front seat and a navigator in the back seat. The uh, difference in, in jobs is not as clearly defined as it used to be. It's more of a, a crew cooperation aircraft. Obviously the pilot's responsible for flying the aircraft, getting it safely off the ground, wherever we're operating, and back to the ground. But on the intercept side, we work very closely with the navigators. The role of the navigator perhaps has lost some of its meaning in latter-day uh, war fighting. Uh, perhaps the description is better as the uh, American uh, weapon system operator, if you will. Uh, certainly the navigator has primary responsibility for the safe navigation of the fighter. However, I would say upwards of 95% of these responsibilities revolve around uh, employing the weapon system, ensuring that the intercept geometry is just right to make the intercept, and making sure that the ordnance is delivered accurately uh, and at the right point. The reason that the back feeder is heavily involved uh, revolves essentially around the way in which the Tornado F3 has been developed as a weapon system. It would be virtually impossible for the aircraft to function with just a pilot. Uh, equivalently, without the controls, even the navigator in isolation could not run an intercept to uh, either weapons launch or identification by himself. So one relies upon the other. And certainly the generation of single-seat fighter pilots in the Air Force has perhaps now disappeared with the demise of the Lightning. The armament of the Tornado revolves around three weapons the medium-range Skyflash missile, the short-range Sidewinder missile, and the 27mm Mauser cannon. The primary weapon is probably going to be the, uh, the Skyflash. That's a radar-guided missile. You'd probably call it a beam, beam riding weapon, if you like. Um, the, the parent uh, aircraft radar illuminates the target and bounces back a certain amount of uh, reflected energy, which the missile underneath the airplane can recognize. And it will follow that beam right down to, uh, to the point of impact and uh, s destroy the target that way. It's um, a slightly longer range missile than the, uh, the, s the Sidewinder, which is the alternative. Uh, as we said before, the Sidewinder is carried under the wings. The Sidewinder is uh, probably more commonly referred to as a dogfight missile, slightly shorter range. The difference is it, uh, it actually re requires thermal energy to, uh, to target on. So instead of having a beam to ride down, it actually follows uh, a thermal source most obvious thing on an aeroplane obviously uh, is a jet exhaust and basically that's what you try and aim it at. The missile will see it and indicate to you by certain uh, indications in the cockpit and then once you've fired it, it's basically fine, forget either the missile works or it doesn't work, there's very little you can do about it. Once it's gone it requires no further illumination, um, it just goes and either it hits or it doesn't hit. In spite of the recent changes in aeroplane technology, the essential element of aerial combat, the air crew, has not changed much since the Battle of Britain. I think there are lots of similarities. I mean, obviously I wasn't there at the time, but uh, yes, I'm sure there are. I don't think the pilots are much different. The average age of my uh, junior officer pilots is around about 22, uh, perhaps actually a couple of years older than some of the pilots who fought in the Battle of Britain. But uh, to my mind, and many of these ex-Battle of Britain aces are now honorary members of the squadron, having fought with us, uh, there's a large similarity. I mean, they, have, they, say, uh, they share a similar sense of humor, um, and they have a common interest, which of course is flying aeroplanes. Of course, the aeroplane is considerably different. This is now a two-seat aeroplane. It's uh, day and night capable, uh, fully all-weather capable, where of course, in the Second World War, single-seat Hurricanes, Spitfires, tended to be daylight hours only and tended to be clear air mass fighters, good weather. 
the sophistication of modern combat aircraft demands a great deal more training than was the case during the Battle of Britain. Even though the training regimen is more elaborate, the basic skills needed by a fighter pilot remain very similar. Our current recruiting policy takes people either direct from school or takes them when they've completed their university course. So entrance into the service come in at either 18 or 21 on average. When they arrive in the service, they go through a common training process through officer training school and then through basic flying training. Not until that basic flying training phase is complete do we actually try to assess whether they've got the capability to become a fast jet pilot. About 50% have of those who make it successfully through that initial stage of training. What we're looking for uh, when, we, when we try to choose these people is, first of all, obviously ability and that's the most important thing. Does he have the ability to think quickly under pressure? We're looking for a degree of aggression, a bit of controlled aggression, and uh, equally we're looking for determination, because obviously it's not the easiest job in the world, and you want someone really who has his mind set on becoming what we are today, fighter pilots. During training to become a fast jet pilot, a future Tornado pilot will progress through three different types of training aircraft, each increasing its level of complexity. Starting with a simple chipmunk trainer for elementary training, the pilot will then progress to basic training, flying either the older Jet Provo or the new short Stucano turboprop trainer. The third stage of training will take place on the British Aerospace Hawk Jet Trainer. At the moment, they're, uh, the guys there are flying Jet Provost 5s and Jet Provost 3s, but they're going to be uh, phased out in favor of the Tucano, which is our new, uh, our new trainer, turboprop um, trainer. You go through 120 hours, 130 hours uh, at basic, and at which point you, f you stream for either fast jet, multi-engined or helicopters, and then assume that you go to the fast jet world, you then go to Valley, you do another six months at Valley on the Hawk, and get another uh, 60 or 70 hours. After completion of that course, you get your wings. From the wings course, you then go on to uh, Chivin Royal Brody. Chivin Royal Brody is a tactical weapons unit, so that is the first time that we're actually taught to use the airplane as a weapon system, rather than just something to uh, go parading around the sky in. The Hawk is not only a trainer aircraft, but can double as a short-range air defense fighter, armed with Sidewinder missiles. It has also been built in ground attack and single-seat fighter versions, as seen here. Probably the best-known use of the Hawk is by the RA...
hope to be an engine mechanic. I chose the profession because I was interested in engines and mechanical workings. Um, I like the mechanical side of it and actually fixing things, changing things. And then I like the I like the hours. I like being outdoors. My trade responsibility is for the jet engines, the oil systems, and the fuel systems. But I'm also responsible for crewing in the air, the air crew, marshalling the aircraft, and servicing. The Tornado incorporates many novel technologies. These sophisticated new features were coupled with detailed efforts to simplify its maintenance compared to older RAF multi-engine jet aircraft, such as the Buccaneer. No, there's no comparison. Buccaneers of 1960s, 50s technology, while this is really in the 70s, and even 80s technology. Uh, the whole uh, idea of Tornado is to ease the maintenance uh, task, which they've done a reasonably good job on. Uh, the airframe is uh, far more maintaining, easier to maintain. Uh, access panels, modern access panels, where you don't need a fastening at all to undo fasteners, they just flip open. So it, it's an uh, advantage all around. While the ground crew prepare the aircraft for its next mission, the pilot and navigator suit up. G pants designed uh, to have air pumped into them as G comes on an aircraft, just to keep stop the blood pooling in the bottom of your legs, to keep the as much blood as possible in the top half of your body, so your brain isn't uh, stop having blood going to it. The immersion suit is uh, designed for going into water. It allows you to your skin to breathe while you're in the aircraft and walking around. But if you do go into the water, the the web the meshing in the material will close up and stop water getting in and keeping you dry. There's also rubber boots at the bottom and arm seals, which is air from the air conditioning system that's blowing through the hull. This one down the front uh, to get in and out of. Got your uh, life jacket. That's when they made the tornado, they introduced the arm sleeves for arm restraints for a high speed ejection, where the arm restraints will, this part here will come down and pull your arms in so they don't move around and get broken. attach your G hose in. This will attach to the aircraft seat so you've got uh, air going in there for your G pants. Your microphone headset radios through there and your oxygen through there coming up this hose here. This side here we've got the lanyard which goes in will set off our warning beacon whenever we eject to uh, get the, hel the helicopter home to us. In this pocket here you have the um, flares and other useful bits of kit just to use and stuff out in the sea or the hills and that's where the beacon's kept. This here, if you pull this, will inflate the life jacket and keep you, in, keep you buoyant in the water if you're unconscious. Microphone headset and uh, oxygen mask. Goes over the head, you've got a chin strap, straps to tighten up the headpiece on top of you. The microphone then attaches in to connect you to the main part of the aircraft. Oxygen mask, those go straight in for the oxygen system. And your mask then attaches up to your face. Got two visors. Following a pre-flight inspection, the aircraft is ready for its new assignment. The success of the Tornado depends not only on the air crew and ground crew of the Air Defense Wing, but on supporting units of Strike Command as well. A 
a familiar sight to Tornado air crews is the massive BC-10 tanker aircraft. The BC-10 is used for mid-air refueling and can extend the endurance of the Tornado from about two hours, possible with the Tornado's internal fuel, to more than 10 hours with occasional aerial meetings. Refueling complete, the Tornado can proceed to its mission, the identification of an unknown aircraft. It's immensely exciting. Uh, I suppose it's the raison d'etre for our existence in peacetime, air policing. Uh, I have intercepted upwards of 30 uh, Warsaw Pact aircraft within the United Kingdom Air Defence region, and generally these interceptions result at the end of a very long sortie, uh, up to 10 hours in length with air-to-air -air refueling. Uh, and perhaps uh, the excitement of actually seeing your quarry, which originally had been merely a blip on a radar screen, and it turns into a bare delta. It's, it's a, a good sense of achievement.